thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We have the honor today of having Dr. Theodore, Dr. Schwartz is a David and Ursula Barnes professor in minimally invasive surgery, director of the anterior skull base and pituitary surgery, director of Center for Epilepsy and Pituitary Surgery, and co-director of Surgical Neuro-Oncology. Today at the 2021 AWBNC, Dr. Schwartz is going to share his lecture, Endoscopic Resection of Anterior Skull Base Meningiomas. Please type write your questions on the Q&A panel. We will read them after the end of Dr. Schwartz's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Schwartz, and thank you. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start my lecture. It's uh, an honor to be here talking to all of you. I uh, hope you all can hear me well, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how to incorporate minimally invasive approaches into the treatment of anterior skull base meningiomas, because some meningiomas are good candidates for this type of approach and others are not. And it's really about selecting the right cases and then about the right technique. So I have a couple of uh, disclosures. I wanna thank some of the uh, fellows who have spent time with me, analyzed some of my data and helped me put together a bunch of these slides. I work out of Cornell in Manhattan at our Institute for Minimally Invasive Skull Base and Pituitary Surgery started by myself and Dr. B.J. Anand. This is a look at what our operating room looks like. Um, you'll notice that we tend to put our scope on a scope holder, which a lot of people don't do, but it's how we do it here at Cornell. Um, and I like the scope holder because it fixes my eye in space, so it's not moving around. I can put a 30 degree scope on a scope holder and then also use a 45 degree scope, which I hold in my hand. We usually have two screens across from each other as well as navigation at the top of the bed. So let's talk a little bit about the concept of minimally invasive or more appropriately minimal access neurosurgery because there's nothing minimally invasive about it. It's just losing a shorter and smaller port for access. It's less trauma to the patient. There's fewer complications. Procedures may take longer because they're technically difficult to do. You have a very small working area the learning curve may be longer. Uh, but when you choose to do a minimally invasive approach or minimal access approach, you can't compromise your outcome. So we're trying to achieve the same thing as you would achieve through a larger opening, just through a smaller opening. And there's no question that the same outcome can be achieved using a less invasive procedure. Ultimately, the field will move in that direction. And we've seen that happen in multiple other fields, as well as in neurosurgery for uh, certain pathologies that we now uh, routinely uh, remove or treat using less invasive techniques. So the keys to success are really case selection. You have to carefully study your preoperative films. You have to know the limitations of the approach. You have to understand what the goals of surgery are and make sure you can accomplish them. And then you have to take the time to acquire the appropriate technical expertise. You have to have adequate experience. You have to have the proper instrumentation and you have to have a good exit strategy. You need a plan for closure. So I'm gonna start by talking about meningiomas of the planum and tuberculum. These tend to sit in front of the optic chiasm. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the approach and how we take them out, but it's important to understand the basic relevant anatomy of the sphenoid sinus, if it's well aerated. Uh, if it's not, you have to imagine these structures are there, including the uh, medial and lateral optical carotid recesses, the tuberculum and the planum. So when we're taking out a meningioma, we don't just take out the base of the meningioma. It's important to open up the optic canals. These tumors often invade, about two thirds invade the medial optic canals. So we have to open that up to get the whole tumor out. It's very important to understand where the superior intercavernous sinus is gonna be, uh, how the superior hypophyseal arteries come off. In every patient, it's different. They're redundant, they're mul multiplicative, uh, and you need to figure out which ones you can take and which ones uh, you can't take. So meningiomas have been around for a long time and we have tended to use this grading system in terms of the goals of our surgeries. And this grading system was developed in 1957 before the surgical microscope was being used, before we had post-operative MRI scans that could tell us if there was residual tumor or not. And it really was an objective grading scale where the surgeon at the time of surgery would look in the cavity and say whether he thought he got it all out or not whether he was able to cauterize the base of it or not. And the more you did, the, the less likely the tumor was to recur. But recent studies have shown that that grading system is really pretty inaccurate. 
And with the microscope and radio surgery and post-op MRI scans, um, most of these patients do roughly the same. And the goal of surgery is really to do as radical a resection as you can safely do, uh, but to not to push the extent of resection and also not to rely on our subjective judgment when we look at the uh, operative field, particularly endonasally. I don't think it makes any sense to use a Simpson grade endonasally because you really can't see laterally. You can't see the tail. What I, if I don't see any residual tumor, it doesn't mean I got a grade zero or grade one resection. Um, really the post-op MRI scan is gonna give you a better sense of whether there's tumor left behind or not. And more and more studies are showing that. So I'm not gonna talk about Simpson grading. I'm just letting you know why. Um, but I will talk about extent of resection on post-op MRI scan, because I think that's more relevant. So some of the questions we're gonna address, can minimally invasive approaches, endonasal or keyhole, provide a durable progression v survival? Uh, some of the criticisms initially are that we weren't really gonna prevent long-term recurrence. And how do we select our cases for surgery? And the terms I'm gonna use are for planum sphenoidale meningioma, tuberculum meningioma that are arising from the tuberculum, which is uh, between the cella and the planum. And then olfactory groove meningiomas that extend anteriorly to the olfactory groove. They can also be involved the planum, uh, but they're very much over the uh, olfactory groove. So the workhorse traditionally has been arterional craniotomy, but the problem with the terional is that you're coming in from above and really what you're seeing are the optic nerves and the carotid arteries and all the uh, structures that you're trying to preserve are in your way. And you also have to retract the brain out of your way often to get there. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the techniques that we use to get out one of the, some of these tumors from below. So this is a, a nice example of a case where someone might say, well, there's a lot of tumor in the medial optic canal. You shouldn't do this from below, or there's some tumor extending laterally. And the truth is there's no question that that medial optic canal has got to be opened up if you want to uh, take these tumors out. So after doing a surgery like this, this is the view you get. You have to open up the medial optic canals bilaterally. Here you can see the optic uh, chiasm, the lamina terminalis, A1, ACOM, A2, the olfactory nerve, gyrus rectus, all that is available to you. And then the pituitary gland, of course, below. Tuberculum meningiomas tend to present with asymmetric visual loss, which we used to think had to do with asymmetric invasion of the uh, optic canals. And that may play a role in it. Vision often gets better postoperatively, but one thing we noticed from below is that the optic nerve is often squished against the A1 branch. And you can actually see through the optic nerve. It's so thin because of that chronic pressure. You can imagine if you're coming in from above and you have to remove that optic nerve at all, you're gonna damage it. But from below, you can retract the tumor off the nerve rather than retracting the nerve off the tumor. Look how thin the optic nerve can be against that A1 branch. When you're coming in from above, the optic nerve sits here, carotid sits here. This was a patient who had surgery through a craniotomy, and lo and behold, that's where their residual tumor was in that blind spot below the optic uh, nerve. But the medial optic canal is very, very easy to expose endonasally. You just have to be aware of the ophthalmic artery, which sits inferior. It's also important to resect the diaphragma cella, which uh, we can do endonasally. A lot of these tumors do extend down to the diaphragma. Uh, so here's an example of a case you'll see that it looks like one of the A2 branches is actually encased in the tumor. And some might call this a contraindication, but in fact, most of the time there is an arachnoid plane around the tumor and you can dissect that out endonasally. You also see the tumors invading the medial optic canals. Here you see it extends down into the cella, which makes it a good uh, uh, case for an endonasal approach. So the first thing we'd wanna do, of course, is harvest a vascularized nasal septal flap. Oh, my, uh, my um, image is not great. It's jumping up. Oh, now it's got better. Good. So we're going to remove the uh, base of the skull, uh, the tuberculum and the planum all around the tumor, uh, all around the base of the tumor. And then we're going to internally decompress it. And then I like to dissect over the top of the tumor first. Uh, and there you see those A1 and A2 branches. And we'll use sharp dissection to dissect it off. Sorry, it's sort of jumping back and forth. I'm not sure why. And then we'll internally decompress it with this uh, element or eloquence device, and then carefully dissect here where it's the top of the A1 branch that we're dissecting off the tumor. Next, we'll open up the medial optic canal on one side and we roll the tumor out of the canal and away from the nerve. 
and then we'll continue to internally decompress the tumor and we'll open up the contralateral optic canal and roll the tumor away from the optic canal on that side. Uh, and then sharply dissect the tumor off the nerve. Here you can see we're sharply doing that dissection. Sorry for the jumpiness of the video. And then we'll resect the diaphragma cella sharply and then roll the tumor up off the stalk. You can see that here when it slows down and then take the tumor out. And for closure, we have different closure types that we do. One is to do what's called a gasket seal where we put a piece of fascia lata over the defect and then we wedge in a piece of med pore. Here we're wedging in the med pore and then we cover that with a vascularized flap. We also use the button closure where we use an inlay onlay. And I'll show you a video of that. Uh, and we like to use glue, either Duraseal or Adherus to hold it in place. This is a post-op scan just showing you that vessel that's been dissected free, shows you the uh, fascia lata closure. Uh, you can see the stalk has been preserved. You can see the nasal septal flap over the med pore, how that looks post-operatively. These are just some other examples, preoperative MRI, post-operative MRI showing you gross total resection, radiographic gross total resection of the tumor. Another preoperative MRI, you can see the uh, A2 branches right on the back of that tumor there. Uh, and then post-op, the tumor gone, chiasm decompressed. Uh, this was an interesting case we did of a meningioma within the third ventricle, which we took out endonasally. Uh, again, it's a great approach to go up the long axis of the tumor. This is not a great case, but not because of this image, more because of this image. If you see how far laterally the tumor extends past the optic nerves, and then you'll also see that the optic nerves are surrounded and cased by the tumor. It's very hard to work on the far side of the optic nerves uh, endonasally if they're encased like this. So we would do this through a craniotomy to just get a wider field of view. So with respect to our results, um, we're probably up at about uh, 90 of these cases by now, but when we last looked at it closely, we had done 61, we separated them into uh, group one, which is the first eight we did before we really knew our, how to do these cases, how to close. And then from 2008 on, uh, 53 cases where we closed with the gasket, the nasal septal flap. Uh, and what we found was that our gross total resection rate went up from 62% to 91%. And for craniotomy, the gross total resection rate is only about 84%. And visual improvement was much higher, 83% compared to 57% for craniotomy. And that's really the advantage of the endonasal approach for well-selected cases is the visual outcome is better. And that's why we're doing these operations for vision. With respect to CSF leak, our leak rates went from 25% to only 6%. And that really is uh, more acceptable. 25 is just too high. But the two that leaked were basically obese patients where we couldn't place a lumbar drain and their BMI was so high. And we took them back and did a cut down and actually put a lumbar drain in and, and their leak stopped. So uh, those would not have been leaks if we'd gotten the lumbar drain in first. And it also reiterates the fact that in patients with very high BMI, it's important to do a lumbar drain to prevent a post-op leak. Uh, we wrote this paper in uh, the Journal of Neurosurgery, again, looking at our results, showing that um, when you compare the endonasal results, they've gotten better uh, in the five years from 2012 to 2017, the gross total resection rates are as high or higher than a transcranial surgery, as you see here. And the CSF leak rates in some centers have gone down to 0% compared to 6% for transcranial. And before 2012, the endoscopic rates were just too high. But this is the real improvement is visual improvement up to 90% in some centers, which really is better than what you get through a transcranial approach. Gross total resection rates uh, improved, CSF leak rates have declined and visual improvement rates surpass. So that's why for well-selected cases, I prefer an endonasal approach because I think the visual uh, improvement rates just are better. We did a study where we tried to compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges, because if you do a retrospective study, it's possible that some of the transcranial cases are much bigger tumors and the endonasal cases are smaller tumors. And how do you compare those results? You really can't. So what we did was we looked at all the cases um, that had been done at uh, Cornell. This was the paper we wrote. Um, and we looked at all the ones that have been done transcranially from 2000, 2015, endonasally from 2008, 2015, and we created a PowerPoint of axial sagittal coronal images, and we sent it to three experts. And we said, can these tumors be removed equally well transcranially and endonasally? So we want to make sure we're comparing the same types of cases. So we only got cases that could be removed endonasally, but some of those happened to have been removed through a craniotomy. And then we could compare 
their outcomes. So this is an example on the left of transcranial, sorry, of endonasal case on the left, transcranial case on the right. You can see they're roughly the same size. We had 18 patients that had their tumors removed endonasally, 15 transcranially. Preoperative tumor size was about the same. Uh, the preoperative flare signal in the brain was about the same, but our gross total resection rates were higher with endonasal. It wasn't statistically significant, but our extent of resection was also higher for endonasal. Um, also not statistically significant, but both of those were higher. Um, but we're not claiming we can take out more of the tumor. We're gonna leave that and say not significant. But what we do see is that when you do transcranial, there's more flare volume change in the brain from retraction than endonasal, more DWI injury to the brain than endonasal. That was statistically significant. And what else was statistically significant was visual improvement and visual deterioration. More deterioration with transcranial, more improvement with endonasal. Um, and the complications were about the same. In fact, actually transcranial was a little bit higher because those patients had seizures, strokes, hemorrhages, hemiparesis, things like that, which offset the CSF leak rates. So um, the most important thing in choosing these cases is really case selection. Uh, having a cortical cuff is not that important. We've shown that brain edema is not that important. It's really just making sure that you can remove the entire tumor endonasally. So we did another study looking at that question of which ones were we able to get a gross total resection rate? How, do, how could we predict that? And what was our long-term outcome? And we found that of these 51 cases of supracellular meningiomas, we got a gross total resection 85% of the time. And we looked at different risk factors for subtotal resection, such as size, whether it was a reoperation, whether the ICA was encased, whether the ACA was encased, whether the um, optic canal was invaded. And we also used a new uh, grading score, which is whether it was lateral to the optic nerve. And we graded that zero, one, two, three, based on whether it was right over the nerve or over the nerve, 50% or 100%. And what we found was that the risk factors for a subtotal resection were reoperation. So if they've had prior surgery, they're less likely to get a gross total resection. And if the tumor was lateral to the optic nerve, um, they were less likely to get a gross total resection. And if the ICA was completely encased, they were less likely to get a gross total resection. But size really wasn't that important. And in terms of the recurrence, we had one recurrence and that patient who recurred after, sorry, we had one recurrence after a gross total resection that patient actually had an atypical meningioma. She had transformed into an atypical meningioma, which may have contributed to her occurrence. Um, if patients had a near total resection, about half of them recurred. Obviously, all of the subtotal resections, 80% of those recurred. Vision was improved or stable in 93% of the cases, 10% uh, CSF leak, uh, four of which were managed just with lumbar drain. Those were the, uh, some obese patients where we just put in a lumbar drain and stopped it. One, only one required a reoperation. So if we looked at the things that uh, had a propensity to lead to uh, a subtotal resection, we could come up with a grading scale. And based on your grading scale, we could figure out if you were gonna have a gross total resection or a subtotal resection. And the risk factors really are prior surgery, uh, canal invasion, complete ICA encasement, and extension past the lateral optic nerve. And you can have one of those. That canal invasion will not prevent you from uh, having a gross total resection, but if you have uh, two of those or more, then you're more likely to have a subtotal resection than a gross total resection. So reoperation really is a major uh, factor and extension lateral to the optic nerve and lateral to the carotid artery and circumferential encasement of the carotid artery is a big problem. So these were the um, uh, follow-up survival analysis curves based on extended resection for uh, these meningiomas. And what you see is that if you do a gross total resection of the tumor, uh, the recurrence rate uh, is very, very low. So it is a durable control. Um, this is that gasket seal where we uh, take uh, either alloderm or fasciolata bigger than the defect and wedge in a piece of med pork until um, it's firm and then cover it with a nasal septal flap. Um, we've also started, uh, we use Duraceal or Adherus on top of that. Uh, you don't wanna pinch the optic nerves so we can cut slits into the, uh, the med pork. Um, but here's a video of a button closure. Um, here we're taking out a meningioma. Um, we put an inlay of Duraform. We've been using this closure a little bit more because it seems to work well and it's a soft closure. So there's no risk of pinching anything with the med pore. And you take two pieces of alloderm. You don't even have to use fasciolata so you can save the patient uh, a thigh incision and you tie them together. This is uh, something we adopted from Jefferson, from um, Evans uh, 
uh, and you do an inlay onlay uh, of these two layers of alloderm, uh, and then you cover that with a vascularized flap. Sometimes we actually put fat below the flap. So we'll do uh, the button, put a little fat on top of it, and then use the nasoceptal flap. And it seems to work very, very well. So um, the gasket, although the gasket is a great closure, there is some risk of pinching the nerve. And we, we've been doing that a little less lately. Um, I wanna talk about olfactory meningiomas because some people talk about taking these out endonasally. Uh, and I wanna compare their transcranial to endonasal results and then look, talk about the eyebrow incision. So. This is the uh, biggest series of transcranial surgery for olfactory group meningiomas. 10% risk of bleeding, 14% risk of brain swelling, 3.5% uh, risk of death. Uh, and they don't even talk about anosmia as a risk factor because they just assume everyone's gonna get anosmia, I assume, but they really don't all get anosmia. If you look at endonasal surgery for olfactory group meningiomas, um, the results are not so great. And this is out of uh, Pittsburgh. These guys are great surgeons, so it's not a technical issue, of course. But length of surgery was nine hours, length of stay 11 days. 30% uh, of patients needed a reoperation, 30% needed a repair of a CSF leak. And gross total resection rate, if it was greater than four centimeters, was uh, only 45%, which really is pretty low. And CSF leak 38% if the tumor is greater than four centimeters. But if your tumor is less than four centimeters, so you have good results, um, and you do a craniotomy, uh, sorry, if you do an endonasal case, very few of those patients have anosmia, but postoperatively, they all have anosmia. So you're basically taking the patients that are the best candidates for endonasal surgery are the ones that have their sense of smell, and you're going to eliminate their sense of smell. So these are the complications of the endonasal approach, 30% CSF leak, 8% respiratory failure, 6% hydrocephalus, 6% brain abscess. And even after they started using the SSF flaps, they still had a lot of CSF leaks. It didn't really get that much better. So if you ask which is a better case for uh, endonasal surgery, the one on the right, in my opinion, is too big. You're not going to get the whole thing out. The one on the left has their sense of smell intact. And although you could take the whole thing out, you're going to deprive them of their sense of smell. So neither is a good approach. Olfaction is very important. So olfaction preservation with endonasal surgery is essentially 0%. With the craniotomy, it's about 50%. And if you have olfaction intact with a smaller tumor, it's up at 80%. And if you don't have olfaction with the bigger tumor or it's impaired, it's lower. So uh, maybe 40%. So if you look at the endonasal results for olfactory groove meningiomas and you compare them to craniotomy, the results really are not as good. Gross total resection rates are lower in the 70s, as opposed to 80, almost 90%. CSF, -like, CSF leak rate is about 25 to 30%. Visual improvement may be a little better, but that's not the main problem with these olfactory group meningiomas. And anosmia with endoscopic skull base surgery is 100%, whereas with transcranial, it's only 50%. So I'm not a big fan of endonasal resection of olfactory group meningiomas. I like to do a minimally invasive approach, but instead use an eyebrow incision. So you can make a little incision in the eyebrow, in the eyebrow. Uh, the issue with the eyebrow is what you can see is, is, is in blue here. There are blind spots if you use a microscope, and those blind spots are where the tumor is, cribriform plate, crystagalli. So you do have to use an endoscope if you want to uh, take out the tumor and see everything. So it's a keyhole surgery, but you have to use endoscope assistance at some point because there are blind spots to this approach. This is the view with the endoscope where you really can see much more. You see we can see the olfactory nerve all the way forward. You see a beautiful view of the um, optic nerves. Um, we started doing some endonasal cases of olfactory group meningiomas. Our results on the right showed we were not very good at it. Our gross total resection rates were low. Um, anosmia was high. Complication rates were high. And then we started doing an eyebrow incision, and, and our results were much better. Essentially, gross total resection rate in everybody in this small series. I'll show you a bigger series. Um, and uh, we were able to preserve smell in almost 50% of the patients. This is what it looks like cosmetically. This woman gave us permission to use her image. You can see the eyebrow incision heals beautifully. Uh, there's very little defect. Uh, this woman had very thin eyebrows. She looks great. Um, you also see that uh, discomfort is minimal and cosme cosmesis in this large study, uh, people are essentially very satisfied, uh, one or a two in almost every uh, uh, patient, just a couple of percent, maybe 5% are unsatisfied with the cosmetics. So we make our incision, sorry, right in the eyebrow. Uh, medial, sorry, lateral to the superorbital notch, make a burr hole in the keyhole. I like to take out the orbital rim 
uh, in a one-piece craniotomy with the orbital rim. Uh, and then you open up the uh, dura. And then you have to drill off the roof of the orbit, uh, those lumps and bumps, uh, to get a clean view of the skull base. And then gentle retraction on the frontal lobe. You really can't retract it that much because your opening is so small. And you get a great view of the chiasm uh, in the optical carotid recess as well. Um, this has been well described, uh, you know, by um, Axel Perneski and the other people working in Mainz. Uh, and Charlie Teo is a big user of this. So we've, we've really, and, and Dan Kelly as well, um, we've been using it now for a good 15 years. Um, one thing we, we noticed is that the medial optic canal is very hard to see through an ipsilateral eyebrow approach. Um, we recommend going contralateral. Uh, we've been using that when we need to get to the medial optic canal. So sometimes a cross court approach is better because uh, the optic nerve will be in your way depending on what you're trying to see. This is the view of the medial optic canal from the other side. And again, this is that view. So from the other side, you see the medial optic canal better. This side medially is, is obstructed. Here's just a post-op scan. So um, here's an example of a nice size uh, olfactory group meningioma. Um, here's a video. We've already done the approach. We're drilling out the orbital roof. We'll open up the uh, dura. We uh, retract the frontal lobe for a little while. Uh, and then internally decompress the tumor. Here we're using the microscope. We take what comes easily with the microscope and then you'll see there'll be some residual and uh, the residual will get out with the uh, endoscope. So you mobilize the tumor off the frontal lobe, careful bimanual microsurgery like we're all used to doing. Um, and then when you get to the limits of what you can see with the microscope, you'll have to bring the endoscope in. So you'll see that in a second. We really can't see anymore at some point. And um, you'll see we're gonna use this element or this eloquence which burns the tumor, uh, it sort of vaporizes it. And then we can't really see anymore. So here we're gonna bring the endoscope in in a second. Here's the endoscope. So you can see there's some tumor left in the cribriform plate and truly by the Christi Galli. But with a 45 degree scope, you can see that really well. And you can look around and do bimanual surgery and you can buzz that dura down uh, into bone. Now you can't remove any hyperostatic bone with this approach because you really can't reconstruct the floor. So that's something you have to keep in mind that there may be residual hyperostatic bone and tumor could regrow from there. There's the very anterior part of the tumor uh, adjacent to the crystal galley. So here's a post-op scan uh, showing you the extent of resection. So we published a paper of 17 patients where we did an eyebrow for olfactory group meningiomas. Let me see if these, uh, it's supposed to advance. I have little circles that are supposed to come up. There we go. So 17 patients, um, 15 cubic centimeter tumor, uh, gross total resection rate, uh, 94%. Um, Pre-op flare was 9.8 cubic centimeters, post-op about the same. So we, you know the brain retraction is minimal. You don't get much change in flare. Length of stay uh, average was three days. So they get out of the hospital pretty fast. Uh, we have 32 months was the average follow-up. We had 11 patients with greater than two years follow-up. There were two recurrences in the cribriform plate. So one of them went for SRS. So didn't need more surgery. And the other one had an endonasal to take out the tumor that was extending down into the ethmoids. Um, visual improvement, 75%. And here, most importantly, new post-op anosmia, only 20%. So we're able to preserve one of those olfactory nerves and preserve their sense of smell. But you can't drill out the cribriform plate. So you have to know that, but you can treat that with SRS and it responds very well. Or you can go in from below if there's extensive bone involvement and do an endonasal approach. Uh, gamma knife works well for olfactory meningiomas, uh, residual tumors, 95% um, tumor control and the rate of new olfaction or rate of deterioration of olfaction was 0%. In this, uh, in this paper. So we wrote a paper sort of looking at um, algorithms for uh, how to choose uh, which minimally invasive approach to use. Uh, and basically depends on whether you have an olfactory group meningioma or not, uh, and how far lateral it goes and where, where it is. So if you have an olfactory group meningioma, we tend to do you know, a superorbital approach, but you can do a terional or a subtemporal um, and then depending on whether olfaction is preserved, whether there's cribriform plate invasion or not, you can follow these algorithms to figure out which would be the best minimally invasive approach 
uh, to use. So that's uh, published in one of our papers. I lastly wanna talk about transorbital surgery because we've used this for some of our uh, meningioma patients, uh, mainly for sphenoid wing. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about other uh, tumors, but the transorbital approach has become uh, more accepted and we, we were having more and more experience with it ourselves. Sphenoorbital meningiomas uh, invade the orbit, invade the sphenoid bone. Um, my, in my feeling, most of the treatments are for proptosis. You try to get out as much tumor as you can if there's residual irradiated, but you really wanna relieve the proptosis. If the patient has a big intradural component, I don't use the orbital approach if most of the tumor is intradural. But there are some tumors that are mostly hyperostatic bone, and those are great for the transorbital approach, in my opinion. Um, I learned this from Dusik Kong, so I just have to give him some credit. Uh, but we did uh, our first two cases. We published this a couple of years ago. These were cases, as you can see here, are mostly hyperostosis with proptosis. So this is a great case to come in and basically just drill out all this bone through a transorbital approach. There's very little intracranial tumor here uh, that you may leave behind because you don't want to leave that behind. This shows you uh, 3D CT showing you where that is. And then you can just drill out that hyperostosis and let the orbit fall back. And you can go all the way to the middle fossa dura with that drilling. So here we've done the transorbital approach. Uh, again, it's sort of jumpy, the video. Um, but we're attracting the orbit and we're drilling out the sphenoid bone laterally. And you can drill out that sphenoid bone basically between the superior and inferior orbital fissure uh, all the way down to the middle fossa uh, dura. Sorry about that video, but this shows you what it looks like afterwards with all that uh, drilled out. And you can see here's the superior orbital fissure, here's the inferior orbital fissure. So all that bone in between is free to drill out. The optic nerve is all the way over here and you just get someone to retract the orbit for you. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. So in conclusion, um, endonasal endoscopic surgery provides equivalent gross total resection rates with better visual outcome, but higher rates of CSF leak. Uh, you trade your seizures and wound infection for sinusitis and anosmia, right? So um, each approach has different risks. So when you do a craniotomy, there's a risk of seizures and wound infection. Um, when you go endonasal, there's a risk of sinusitis and anosmia. Simpson grade, I don't think is a useful metric for skull-based tumors. Um, so that's a whole separate conversation, but more and more papers are coming out uh, showing that post-op MRI scan is probably a better metric for a recurrence than your subjective assessment when you're doing your surgery. Um, endonasal surgery appears to provide durable response and good long-term control if you choose your patients well. Uh, removal of bone and devascularization of tumor may contribute, right? We're taking off all the bone through our endonasal approach, uh, which you don't always do through a transcranial approach. And that may explain why you get good long-term uh, control. It's appropriate to choose your cases carefully. For planum and tuberculum meningiomas, tumor lateral to the optic nerve, completely encasing the ICA, and reoperations predict subtotal resection. So, if these things are going on, you should seriously consider doing a craniotomy. But complete encasement of the anterior cerebral arteries, partial encasement of the internal cerebral artery, tumor size, unilateral canal invasion are not predictors of subtotal resection. So those should not dissuade you, any of those by themselves should not dissuade you from doing the case endonasally. Um, EEA is not appropriate for the majority of olfactory group meningiomas, but an eyebrow superorbital approach can be used. And in my opinion, it's a preferable minimal access approach. So that's the end of my talk on meningiomas and I am available to answer any questions. Um, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz for this uh, wonderful lecture. Um, we have a few questions from the audience. First question is, uh, do you customize MedPer implants and how do you do it? So the way you customize it is you, you take a scissors and you cut out, you cut it to the shape you want. What I often tend to do is I will, um, you know, put something in and measure out the defect. And once I know the exact size of the defect, I'll put a patty in there. I'll take the patty out and then I'll measure it on the, uh, the med pore and I'll cut the med pore out. And if I know where the optic nerves are, I'll cut little wedges in there, but we definitely tailor it to the size of the defect. Okay, thank you. Under which circumstances would you consider a combined endonasal transcranial approach? 
Yeah, you know, we've done that less and less. We have tend not to do both at the same time. We tend to do one that we think is gonna get out the majority of the tumor and then see what we have. And if we have to, occasionally we'll go back. Uh, mostly we'll go in through the nose. Um, you know, if it's a giant like macroadenoma, we'll go in through the nose, try to take everything out and then give it some time to see if it, if it comes down. Um, I have recently had a case where I went in through the nose and I just didn't take out the supercellar part. And I went back in through an eyebrow and took out the rest a couple of days later. Um, but we tend not to do combined approaches. They're just awkward. They take a long time. Um, usually you can find one dominant approach to do most of the case. And then if you need to come back later, you know, I try to stage it by time, not do it at the same time. Thank you. Um, which technical nuances would you suggest for tumors that surround anterior circulation vessels? So, you know, I like to come over the top of the tumor, as I mentioned, because when you get to the top, the very front of the tumor, there's not much there um, that you're gonna hurt. There are not many blood vessels unless you see one on the you know, frontopolar artery on the MRI scan. But then you can sort of you know, decompress the tumor and roll it down until you get to those A2 branches. And then you need to decompress the tumor and then try to I use a bipolar and try to shrink the tumor and then pull it away gently from the vessels and then take sharp scissors and cut any arachnoid adhesions it may be there between the vessel and the tumor and then internally decompress, pull it away, do sharp dissection. You know, you just don't want to, you can't just pull on everything. You have to see exactly what you're looking at and see if there are any attachments that need to be cut. Okay. How does previous radiosurgery, radiotherapy affect your surgery and degree of resection? Yeah, there's no question that we do a less good job if they've had radiation beforehand. There's much more scarring in there. Um, I find this particularly true with craniopharyngiomas. Uh, we've published a paper on that, which is why if I see a recurrent craniopharyngioma, um, if I think I can get out the whole tumor, I'll recommend surgery before radiation because once they've had radiation, they, everything gets scarred in. It's very hard to get the whole tumor out. You're basically will never be able to get a gross total resection or it's very difficult after prior radiation. So, you know, I talk to patients about that, you know, when they have recurrences, whether to send them for radiation or whether to, if I think I can get the whole thing out with another surgical procedure, I'll try to convince them to do that rather than radiation. Um, but obviously if I don't think I can get it all out, then I would send them for radiation because they're gonna need it anyway. So uh, unless they have mass effect that needs to be decompressed, there's not a real advantage to just taking out part of the tumor. Have another related question. In which cases do you consider radiotherapy or radiosurgery? So, um, you know, that's a very broad question because every pathology is different. If I take out a craniopharyngioma and I feel like I've gotten as much as I can possibly get out and there's residual and I don't think I can get any more out, I'll recommend radiation because those will often grow back. However, if I leave a pituitary tumor in the cavernous sinus, I will not necessarily radiate that. I will follow it and see what its growth rate is. Same thing with meningiomas. Uh, sometimes they grow very slowly, whereas cranios tend to grow more quickly. And then you can also look at the pathology. Like if that, if that pituitary adenoma has a Ki67 above three, there's more than a centimeter of tumor there. Uh, the recurrence rate might be higher. I might recommend radiation sooner rather than later for that case. So. It's very case by case, depending on how quickly I think the tumor is going to grow back and what the ramifications are going to be of that tumor growing back and whether I think I can do more surgery at that point or whether I don't want to be in a position where I have to consider more surgery because the first surgery was maybe so hard, I'd rather just radiate it now. Okay. Does embolization have a role to play in the treatment of anterior skull base many yeah. It's a good question. You know, I would say very little. There are very few arteries uh, that they can embolize that are gonna help you because they're all related to the ophthalmic or the superhypophyseals. They can't really get in there. They don't wanna go in the ophthalmic. Um, so I haven't really embolized many of these uh, cases or found embolization to be very helpful. Thank you. Does the tumor consistency affect the choice of the route for resection of tuberculum cellomeningiomas that encase the vessels of the circle of wills. I mean, it's hard to know the consistency. I mean, I think if you know your tumor is rock hard, uh, then you may choose to do a craniotomy if you feel like that'll be better. Although sometimes uh, 
you know, ones that are very hard, if you drill out the base of it, then they just kind of fall down, even if it's a hard knuckle of tumor. Um, I, you know, unless you've been there before, you really don't know the consistency. You can be very surprised. So I tend not to make consistency an issue for my first operation because I don't know what the consistency is going to be. Uh, if I've been there before and it's very firm and fibrous, then that could be an issue if it recurs because then I know what the consistency is. Yeah, it makes sense. So what type of instruments and craniotom do you use uh, for a supraorbital craniotomy involving the orbital groove? Um, I'm trying to find that question. So I could read it. By Nishan Sadashiva. Oh, okay. Yeah, there were some others before that. Um, what type of instrument and craniotome do you use with the orbital roof? So actually I've switched what I do. So now I'm, I'll use a standard acorn to make my burr hole, craniotomy. I'll use the hole maker, which is like the C1 bit to make the cuts through the orbit because it's a very, very thin cut. And then to drill out the orbital roof, I've started using a two diamond because there's very little room in there. And if you use a big drill, you'll tear up the dura. And if you use a very small drill, you can just get it right on the bone and shave it down. I don't use the matchstick anymore. And I, I try to use a two diamond. Smaller the drill, the better. Thank you. Did you inject contrast through a lumbar drain to evaluate CSF lake in all cases? So contrast, I assume they mean fluorescein. And the yeah. answer is yes. If I put a lumbar drain in, it means I think there's a high risk of a leak. So I'll put fluorescein in. We used to do lumbar punctures for fluorescein. We don't do that anymore. So if I'm putting a lumbar drain in anyway, I will inject fluorescein. But if I'm not putting a lumbar drain in, I won't put one in just to inject fluorescein. But once it's in, I might as well use it. Okay, thank you. Why going to the orbit and deal with all that fat? <laughs> the same result can be achieved using a simple eyelid crease incision and going through the outside much simpler. No dealing with soft orbital tissue. Well, so in terms of the fat, you know, you want to keep the periorbita intact uh, so that the fat doesn't herniate out. And it's very easy to gently retract on the orbit so it's pushed out of the way. So it's not really herniating into your field. Um, I know a lot of people leave the orbital rim behind. Um, I've not, I found the cosmetic result and the closure to be great taking the orbital rim. And I feel like it's a limited exposure and anything that gets me an extra few millimeters of maneuverability, I want. So I take the orbital rim uh, every time. Okay. What do you recommend um, are the best steps to decrease the risk of CSF leak? How long do you leave a lumbar drain in the bus stop period? Well, CSF leak, so I assume you mean something like a pituitary tumor, because if you're doing a meningioma or craniopharyngioma, you're getting a CSF leak. There's no way around it. For pituitary tumors, the best way to prevent CSF leak is to find the plane of dissection between the tumor and the normal gland so that you leave the normal gland behind, just take out the tumor. And then if you leave the normal gland behind, you won't get a CSF leak. Um, it also depends on how much you open the planum. You know, if you go very high with the planum bone opening, then as the normal gland descends down, you'll get a CSF leak no matter what. So you wanna be high enough to get the tumor out, obviously, so you have to balance that. Um, leaving a lumbar drain, it depends on the closure. If I do a gasket seal, no more than 24 hours. If I use a button, I'll maybe do 48 hours. Uh, and then if, I, if the patient has intracranial hypertension or high BMI, I may leave it in for three days. Great. Um, what is the time to do a visual exam in the post-op period? Well, I do. So I ask my patients immediately, is their vision better, the same or worse? Um, so the time is immediately as soon as they wake up, because if they wake up and their vision is worse, then you have to go back in because you've done something wrong. If they say their vision is worse the next day, you have to go back in because there's something going on. If their vision's the same, then that's fine. And obviously if it's better, it's even better. But um, I ask patients every day after surgery, in terms of formal visual fields, I probably wait a month to do formal visual fields. How do you manage vascular injuries during these approaches? Sorry, which injuries? Vascular, vascular. injuries, yeah. Yeah, so 
Um, that's a great question. I have a lot of videos on vascular injuries um, and we haven't had one in a long time, thank God. But um, injuries of the carotid artery are very hard to repair. And I think if you have a really serious carotid injury, you have to pack it off, go to IR and you know put a stent in or sacrifice. Often you have to sacrifice the vessel because it's very hard to repair those. Um, if you have an injury of A1, A2, like an artery that's a, a decent sized artery, you can try to cauterize it. Um, but I also have had to sacrifice those vessels. A serious arterial injury, much of the time I have to sacrifice the vessel. I'll, I will put a wet clip on it or a uh, aneurysm clip. Um, I'll try to cauterize it. I've tried to put muscle. I don't think the muscle really works that well. Um, so I would say 80 to 90% of the time you end up sacrificing the vessel if you get a big arterial injury. Okay. And what's the net, uh, so can you name the eloquency tool you use to evaporate tumor tissue? Yeah, it's, it used to be called the Elmin and now it's called the Eloquence, E-L-L-I-Q-U-E-N-C-E. Okay. Good for meningiomas. I use it a lot for endonasal meningiomas. Thanks. Is there current evidence with an odd way to think that uh, the endoscopic route favors better visual outcomes and less postoperative edema over the transcranial route? Is there any evidence? There's a lot of evidence. Um, there's dozens of papers written showing that visual outcomes tend to be better with um, endonasal surgery compared to transcranial. Yeah, I presented some, there's lots of papers. Thank you. What should be the ideal postoperative time to perform radiologic assessment with MRI in order to measure residual lesions? So I do an MRI right away. You can see uh, post-op day two if there's a residual tumor, you don't have to wait. Um, and then I'll do another one at three months and then I'll do another one at a year. But uh, we do an MRI while they're in the hospital. Perfect. And the last question is, how often have you think a pre-op tracheostomy is necessary as a precaution for hypertensive air leaks due to valve effect at the reconstruction site? I've never done that. I, I would never recommend that. I think if you're doing that, you're probably are not, shouldn't be doing endonasal surgery or maybe your closures aren't good enough. Um, but you shouldn't be getting such big air leaks that you need to do a pre-op tracheotomy. Well, Dr. Schwartz, um, I'd like to thank you again on behalf of CN. This has been an outstanding lecture. Thank you for your time. We are really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2021 IWBNC. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Take care, everybody. For, you too. Bye -bye. For all the audience, keep in mind this lecture will be available on our website for starting next week. In a few minutes, we'll have Dr. Paul Gardner doing his lecture, Advances in the Skull-Based Surgery, from Endoscopes to Genetics. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned here on the chat screen or check the program schedule on our website, cnhus.com. Thank you.
for all the audience who is still in this virtual room, next conference, Advances in Skull-Based Surgery from Endoscope to Genetics by Paul Garner is going to be done at 2.30. It's going to be done at 2.30. Next conference will start at 2.30. ADT. If you want to log out and then at 2.30 EDT log in again, you can go to our website, cnhus.com and find the link for the upcoming conference by Dr. Paul Garner. He will be doing his lecture at 2.30 EDT, Advances in Skull-Based Surgery from Endoscopes to Genetics. Thank you.